a developer who buys up a large portion of the units could have the ability to take over an association, you know, to hold the voting power in the association. They could turn around and sell the property to themselves. Um, there are all sorts of permutations of that that are not uh, really adequately addressed by a lot of, of the state laws. It starts to sound a little bit like a, a hostile takeover of a publicly traded company when someone buys large chunks of the shares of the stock. I am squirming in my chair just hearing about those kinds of things. Common Sense for Common Areas exists to help all 2 million volunteer board members nationwide have the right information at the right time to make the right decisions for their future. This podcast is sponsored by four companies that care about board members. Association Insights and Marketplace, Association Reserves, Community Financials, and Kevin Davis Insurance Services. You'll find links to their websites and social media in the show notes. Welcome back to Common Sense for Common Areas. I'm Robert Nordland, and I'm here today with two special guests to discuss condo termination or deconversion. And you're likely to think, what is that and why do I care? Well, those are fair questions, but that's exactly why it's important that we bring this episode to you today. This is our episode number two, and before I introduce our topic and our two guests, I want to encourage everyone to check out episode number one, which was a great discussion with co-host and sponsor, Kevin Davis of Kevin Davis Insurance Services. We tell the story of our background and the events that led to the creation of this podcast. So back to today's episode. Think about it. Shortly after you're seated on an airplane, before you take off, the flight attendants go through a safety procedure and they encourage you to look around and see where you're emergency exits are. And last week I went on a date with my wife and in the theater, as the lights began to dim over the loudspeaker, we heard a voice welcoming us to the show, um, encouraging us to silence our cell phones. And again, asking us to look around and identify where the emergency exits are. And that combination of events was enough to have us decide that this particular episode belongs in our number two slot. So we want to welcome you to the podcast and early in the series, make sure you know where the emergency exit is. So today we have two attorneys with us, Eben Hansel and Roger Winston of the national law firm Ballard Spar. Eben and Roger are respectively from their Baltimore and Washington DC offices. They came to my attention a few months ago when they wrote a paper on condo termination. Well, I quickly learned they're experts in their field and they have a heart for community associations and board members. So welcome, Evan. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Great to be here. So now tell us, what is condo termination? Yeah. Um, so condo termination is kind of the flip side of uh, condo creation. And I think most people who are listening to this podcast are probably familiar with the process of forming a uh, condominium. As most people know, uh, each state has its own condominium laws. And to form a condominium, you file a document in the land records, a condominium declaration. Uh, condominium termination is really the reverse of that process. Uh, you take an existing condominium and file paperwork in the land records to terminate it or deconvert it. Uh, and the result of that is the condominium ceases to exist and the, the property returns to the status that it was in before, which may be a, an apartment building and maybe a, a townhouse community, but it is no longer a condominium. Um, and there may be, you know, a lot of reasons for pursuing this route, just given the, the history of condominiums in the United States, a lot of them are now 30, 40, 50 years old and getting towards the end of their useful life. So uh, termination or deconversion is is one route that an association could take to wind down a condominium that no longer wants to continue. You've used uh, two words, termination and deconversion. Are those significantly different or just different ways to phrase the same thing? Uh, I think we're really talking about the same concept. It is not a uh, common occurrence, I would say in the world of condominiums, though it's it's getting more common. So the terminology, we haven't really settled on the terminology. I think termination is used pretty frequently. Yeah, the, um, you using Eben's um, analogy to when you start 
a condominium, if you start a new condominium, you know, from the ground up, a new building, um, you create a, a, a condominium regime. If you have an, a, a, an apartment building and it's in a rental apartment building and you want to change it from having one owner of the apartment building to owners of each of the units, you convert the building to a condominium. So as I've been said, the, you know, the termino terminology for conversion and deconversion is, is sort of in its infancy. And, um, you know, I guess if you looked at that very logically, you would say, oh, well, this building was converted from an apartment building. Now we're going to deconvert it. Whereas if it was never at, um, not a condominium, if it, if it was originally just a piece of ground and a, a new building, then you're going to create the condominium and then terminate it. But I don't think that in practice is how it's used in, in some areas of the country. They talk about all forms of, of discontinuing the condominium ownership as a deconversion in other parts of the country, like in Florida, they, they talk about it as a condominium termination. Got it. You know, actually, as we're talking about it, I remember reading about a conversion, I forget where it was, converting from apartments to condominiums, and the developer didn't pick their timing well and was having a hard time selling. And so after a year or so, they just rolled it back to apartments, deconverted it. They only had a few units that it sold. The developer still owned a significant majority of the units and basically was admitting, I've made a mistake, the timing was bad, let's roll it back to apartments because most of them are rented anyway. It's, so it, it can take many flavors. It could be a developer move. It could be something that lasts for years. It could be short term. It could be long term. But uh, I think the essence of what you're saying is it's owned by many people. And then you get back into the process of ownership by just one person. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and uh, it, it can be anywhere along the spectrum of complexity. I think, you know, the situation that you were talking about, if we're, if it's very uh, soon after the creation or conversion of the condominium and it's still under developer control, uh, then it's really just a paperwork issue. They, you know, they filed a declaration to create the condominium uh, that went from a single unified parcel of property to units and common areas. If it's still all under common ownership, then converting it back, terminating the condominium is really a simple process. You file one in, mo in most jurisdictions, you're filing one piece of paper and it just changes the form of ownership. Where it gets complicated is when you have multiple owners. So the units have been sold to uh, different individual owners. They each have their own individual interests and views on what should happen. And that's where it really gets uh, complex and, and more interesting because then you have to satisfy all the statutory requirements and the requirements in the condominium documents to get to termination. I'm um, writing down questions here um, and I got to remember to make sure I ask both of them. Uh, we talked a little bit about condo termination. Is this also HOA termination also or even a co-op termination or is it all forts, forms of multiple owners condos, townhomes, high rises, um, HOAs, is it all forms? Well, there's a similarity between condominium and co-ops, but co-ops is a little bit different process, but, but I think it's probably more similarities than differences. Co-ops, um, you, you talked, Robert, before about the idea with a condo, you have one owner and then you go to many owners and with a termination, you go back to one owner. With a co-op, the co-op corporation is the owner and the residents um, have, <laughs> uh, have, have leases um, to their <laughs> units. And so if the co-op, for similar reasons that we'll discuss, decided uh, to, um, to terminate, it would be the, again, it would not be the individual owners um, no longer owning their units because they never own their units. It would be the co-op corporation selling its interest, but having to go through a similar process to get 
a significant majority of the of the residents on board uh, with with pursuing this action. An HOA, there is nothing comparable to an HOA uh, termination because term, an HOA doesn't own any property other than perhaps um, some uh, common areas. They may own some streets. They may own a stormwater management pond, a tennis court, you know, some a swimming pool. But the individual homeowners own and own their homes, and I'm not aware of any any methodology, uh, statutory or otherwise, uh, for um, an HOA to terminate and sell the, the all of the property, including the homes that are individually owned, to um, to to a single owner. Um, but but there are definitely similarities between co-ops and condos. Fantastic, Roger. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, that brings up that second question, though, Evan, that you kind of introduced. It gets complicated, various levels of complexity, I think you said. But I can imagine a 100-unit association, 100 different people, classically, um, and then trying to get all those people on the same page, that can be a challenge, I would imagine. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, every community and every project is going to be a little bit different. I think what we've seen out in the world is that there are kind of common themes on why a condominium project may be looking at termination. Um, I think one of the primary ones is that a lot of these buildings that were built as condominiums or converted to condominiums in uh, the 70s and 80s when there was a real boom in condominium development, uh, especially on in coastal areas, are now reaching the end of their useful life. And they're facing these really steep maintenance costs. Uh, they may have to undergo uh, you know, massive and expensive reconstruction uh, efforts in order just to maintain the viability of their building. The unit owners may be unable or unwilling to pay those assessments. Um, in other cases, these buildings are, you know, the buildings themselves are older, are not as valuable as they once were, but are sitting on an extremely valuable piece of a piece of real estate. And the highest and best use of that real estate may be redevelopment for, you know, a larger building, a more modern building that can get, uh, you know, that could get higher prices or higher rents. And it may just make economic sense uh, to terminate the condominium and pursue something else with the property. Um, another scenario that we see is that, uh, you know, a building may have been converted to condominiums in a market that where condominiums just never really took off. And it, it may make sense, more sense as a professionally managed apartment building or a student housing complex or, or some other use beyond uh, a residential condominium. So, you know, it's it's not just the case of trying to convince a uh, hundred different actors out of the blue. Well, a lot of times, they're all facing the same pressures and you know seeing the writing on the wall in the same way. So they may be motivated by similar things. Yeah, Evan, thank you for that. Um, I hear you saying that people are seeing the writing on the wall, and I've heard of situations where people hit get hit with a fifty thousand dollars special assessment, and they say, "Well, that's all my unit is worth." And that begs the question, is it viable to move forward? But you also said that when the land is very valuable, when there's maybe a Hilton a couple doors down around the block or something else, and that tends to suggest maybe there's two phases to this deconversion process, termination process. Can you explain uh, the two different ways someone might drive the bus on this uh, termination? Yeah, I think it it really can come from two sides. I mean, it, it a termination is typically ultimately a sale of, of property, so it's going to take a, a seller and a buyer. Um, in most cases, the you know the seller is go going to be the the owners acting through the association, and the buyer is going to be a developer who has an idea of what they can do with the property. Um, in most cases, they're either going to maintain the property in its current form. Uh, they may 
have some ideas to improve it and turn it into a rental property, or they may just be interested in the land and they want to tear down the existing building and and develop it into something else. The motivation could come from either either sides of that equation. It could be the association that you know is is facing a difficult future in that you know they they have a very expensive maintenance obligation. Uh, they have residents who don't want to continue paying very high assessments to maintain an aging an aging building, and they see termination as an exit strategy. Uh, it could come from the developer side where uh, you know the developers on the lookout for a profitable project. They see this particular piece of property as a likely candidate. Um, and you know if the, if it were a non-condominium building, they might approach the owner of it and make an offer. It's a condominium building, so it's you know there are there are a hundred different owners. So they there is this process by which a developer can approach the association and make an offer, and the owners can come together and accept it, which ultimately would result in termination and sale of the condominium. You spoke earlier about, or I think Roger spoke about the the nuanced difference between a condo and a co-op. A condo is a hundred different owners in our hypothetical today. A co-op is one entity, but a hundred different shareholders. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that's that's that is correct. The process that Evan just described, the the the, the, the what what leads to the decision to terminate to sell the property are similar under both of those scenarios. I, I would just add that um, in addition to what you pointed out, Robert, that uh, you know, owners facing um, substantial special assessments, seeing their building de decline in value, not having you know all of the um, um, amenities and nice things that newer buildings have, those are all <clears throat> factors that may lead into collectively um, unit owners saying it is better and to um, for us to terminate the other sort of motivating factors or influencing factors is in in some cases maybe most cases and the owners um, when this developer approaches them or the association will say we can actually pay you a premium for your unit we can pay you more for your unit than you would ever be able to get on the on the market and you don't have to pay any of those special assessments you don't have to worry about um, any any of those factors. And then the other thing that, that is of a more recent vintage is now because of what happened with Surfside, now the, the states and the local governments are coming into play and they're saying, wow, that makes us look really bad. We, we have, we inspect these buildings, we, we gave building permits, and then when a, a building like that collapses and there's this terrible tragedy, it is not good for the government because people start saying, why, why, how did you let this happen? Why didn't you know the condition of these buildings and so forth? And, and so now there's been a response in, in some jurisdictions, and this seems to be growing, is that the governments, uh, through their condominium acts or otherwise are saying at condominiums you must um, undertake a very extensive evaluation of your building and maybe you have to do that every five years and not only does that evaluation have to tell you what the condition is of these components it has to tell you what their remaining useful life is some things maybe need to be uh, fixed or addressed immediately, some over the next three or five or 10 years, even the things that don't have to be fixed immediately, we are going to make you contribute now for, for the future cost of those items. So, so you have to establish reserves to do that that maybe had not been d done before because these were just deferred maintenance items. So now the condominium is saying, my gosh, we, we have to spend thousands of dollars for this study. And this study tells us we've got a problem building that we're going to have to spend a lot of money for. And at the same time, 
a developer is approaching them and say, you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, we will take the building off your hands and pay you a premium. So th those are those are can be compelling factors that um, that respond to your question, like what? How do you get you know a majority, a substantial majority of the owners agree to agree to a termination because they do have to agree um, to the termination? Well, that's that's why they might um, agree to give up their their homes. Yeah, um, the scenario, Roger, that you're painting is, I can imagine a, an association where there's many owners, maybe a majority of uh, unit owners that have been there a long time. It's been their home for 20 plus years, and they are used to the monthly assessments at a certain level. They've budgeted for that, and they're not used to now the higher expenses due to uh, outside factors or just the decades of deterioration. And I can imagine those would be some contentious board meetings where the board is saying, yeah, it's going to be expensive to live here. And that could unify the homeowners behind the idea that is there another way. And I think what we're talking about today is that other way. A crisis is a unifying factor and that can be good for the association. And now I have more questions. You mentioned Roger, that there may be an opportunity for the homeowners to actually get a premium for the sale of their home. If it's a situation where they've got a crushing special assessment that's about to be levied and they don't feel that they can afford that, they're not sure that the home value can afford it, they're realizing their dream home that they've been in for 20 years isn't worth as much as they thought it was. Is there, is there a distinguishing characteristic between the ones that are crushing problems and the ones where there may be a developer around the corner standing ready, the white knight, ready to rescue those homeowners? Well, I would just say that, that every situation, every project's going to be um, different, going back to something Eben said uh, earlier. If, if the property is in a very desirable and location, and if somebody can can take that property, uh, tear down the existing old building that has all these problems, and put something up that is far more valuable, then th those problems are no longer problems. If you're going to be tearing the building down, you don't have to to make all those repairs. You don't have to do all that remediation. On the other hand, if you have a piece of property that you know is not necessarily in a desirable location and there's nothing that somebody else can really do with the property to make it more valuable, you'll now then have perhaps a situation where the condominium says, it doesn't make sense for us to put hundreds of thousands of dollars per unit owner into this building because we're, we put all that money into the building because we need to, to make it safe and habitable. Um, and then after we do that, after we spend, you know, um, $500,000 per unit, we have units that are worth $250,000. Well, you know, why would we do that? And there may not be a white knight because somebody else says, well, this, this property, because of the zoning, its location, future plans in the area is, is not a desirable thing. I might buy it from you, but I'm not going to pay you a premium. I will pay you maybe something less than that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that you otherwise could get. But you're only going to get that two hundred fifty thousand after you address all these problems. You don't have to address the problems. I'll tear it down, and maybe I'll make it a parking lot, or I'll make it, you know, I'll I'll donate it for a, a, a city park or something like like that. So so there are you know, situations where the burden of, of dealing with the conditions of the building may be so significant, but there may not be a, 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 a higher and best use for that property. But, but situations that Devin and I have seen or observed tend to be more the situations where, um, where there is a better use to the property and therefore this developer would be willing to pay a premium and be willing to take this obligation off of the homeowner's um, hands. 
Yeah. Uh, a couple of follow-ups to that. Um, clearly, every situation is going to be different. And I'm thinking the theme of this is an emergency exit. And an emergency exit gets you out alive. <clears throat> it's not necessarily pleasant. Pleasant would be great. I get more money than I thought I could have. But pleasant may also be I got a reasonable dollar amount for my unit and I'm not having to dig deep and come up with a huge special assessment and go through a year or more of reconstruction. And that's just, it's painful even thinking about that. So an emergency exit may just be that. It may just be a way out, a less painful way out than the consequence of living in an association that is gradually dying on its own. Evan, maybe you could talk about for a moment, what's it look like when it's the developer that has a gleam in uh, their thinking process? They think, ah, I could do a parking lot. I could do a mixed use uh, facility here. What's it look like when it's the developer that's driving the bus? Yeah, so um, the actual process for uh, terminating and selling a condominium property is spelled out in a couple of places. It's in each state's condominium act. They're going to specify uh, the steps that the parties would have to go through and the thresholds that they would have to meet, uh, including the threshold of approval from the owners. And then it's spelled out in the individual condominium declaration may have additional provisions in it, including possibly changing the increasing the threshold for approval. So a developer is going to have to be familiar with those rules and have a strategy for uh, for getting to the approval thresholds. That's usually the, the biggest barrier. So there are a few ways that that can be accomplished. A developer can approach a, the association directly uh, in, a, in a larger building where it's not feasible to deal with individual owners that would probably approach the association. And they could make an offer just like an offer for any other building. Most condominium acts have a process by which the association can negotiate and even enter into a contract for the sale of the property uh, without the approval of the owners. But then the contract is only valid once it's been ratified by the owner. So it kind of flips the process uh, on its head from what you might expect. But the association is negotiating as a seller of the property with the developer as the buyer, and then turning around and getting it, getting the sale ratified by its owners. In reality, it probably the owners are probably involved from the start, but that's the statutory framework: is that the association is is the seller under under a purchase contract to the developer, um, and then the the approval may come after the fact. Might it also be a very, very eager developer that starts buying up one, two, five, ten different homes and is maybe just personally committed to forcing their way in? Does that happen? Yeah, so that uh, that can happen. Um, I, another alternative to negotiating, there are a couple alternatives to negotiating with an association. Um, a developer could talk directly to owners, could try to kind of create a groundswell among the owners. Uh, to meet the threshold. Uh, and the thresholds here are usually in the range of 80%. It's different for each state, but 80% is a pretty common threshold. Um, so a developer could talk to individual owners and try to get them to put pressure on the association to sell the condominium building. Uh, it, a developer also could start buying up units, as you said, and either get to the 80% threshold themselves themselves, or get to the point where the combination of the developer and owners who are on their side together reach the threshold. So that that does happen, uh, that it can create some, uh, some more complex and potentially negative situations if a developer is kind of working from the inside like that. Uh, a developer who buys up a large portion of the units could have the ability to take over an association, you know, to hold the voting power in the association. They could cross the 80% threshold, but still have other owners in the building um, and have the ability to approve a sale unilaterally over the objection of those other owners. Uh, they could turn around and sell the property to themselves. Um, there are all sorts of 
permutations of that that are not uh, really adequately addressed by a lot of, of the state laws. Um, so a lot of interesting and, and potentially uh, devious outcomes there. Um, for those watching on video, they can see me squirming in my chair. For those of you listening, I am squirming in my chair just hearing about those kinds of things. It starts to sound a little bit like a, a hostile takeover of a publicly traded company when someone buys large chunks of the shares of the stock. Um, well, I'm looking at the time and think that we should try to bring this to a close. Just a couple of things to confirm. Uh, Heaven, you mentioned a few times 80%. That's not a hard and fast number. That's going to vary with state laws, governing documents, things like that. But it is a super majority, most likely. Yeah, I um, yeah, I don't have uh, every percentage in front of me, but I think they vary from roughly two thirds, you know, sixty-seven percent. Then in some states, uh, have a hundred percent requirement. You you have to get every owner on board, yeah. um, which, as you can imagine, is a is a hard task. Yeah, and then eighty. 80- 80% is, is, is sort of what some of the model acts have always had. And then since then, they've been um, modified. And I just wanted to point out like one other variation, which is maybe a more common variation, is when the developer, developer doesn't want to take the risk of buying individual units and now owning 20% of the units that he may be paid a premium for and could never get to the threshold he needed. So what they'll often do is enter into a contract and they'll say, I will buy your unit for a premium, but I will only do so if I can get 80% of your neighbors to agree to sell their units. And now, you know, the 20% that have bought on are now going knocking on the door of their neighbors and saying, hey, you really need to do this. It's a good deal. Um, but and but I can't sell my unit to the developer unless you sell your unit as well. So there 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 is up there is an, uh, a useful means of perhaps reaching um, an important critical mass. Very interesting. We're uh, again talking about community associations, and so it's majority control. And so 100% is going to be hard that any board who contacts their attorney, I would imagine that's their first step to find out what are the numbers for our association, is that fair? Contact your attorney as a first step? Yeah, I think that's right. I think any uh, any attorney who is used to dealing with condominium associations, uh, they may not have specific experience with terminations because they are, it's not a very common process, um, but they'll be familiar with the act uh, and will at least know where to look to to provide some advice on what the relevant thresholds are in the, in the state. Yeah, and I think another part of it as we uh, draw this episode to a close is that it is majority rule. It is an emergency exit. It may not be all, what, unicorns and rainbows. Um, It may be a bumpy ride, but it is an emergency exit. And I just think that's a fascinating concept that board members need to keep in the back of their minds as we uh, see the continual aging of our community association industry. Well, uh, thank you for joining us today, Evan and Roger. Uh, please let our audience know how can they get in contact with you should they want some follow-up information. Evan? Uh, yeah, I'm in the, the Baltimore office of Ballard Spar, which is a, a national firm that uh, covers a lot of practice areas. Um, I'm in the real estate group, so we do a lot of condominium work. So I invite them to visit our website at ballardspar.com. And that's B-A-L-L-A-R-D-S-P-A-H-R.com. Yes. And uh, Roger? Yes, the same same thing. If, if you go to our website, you'll see description of our real estate practice and, and you'll see you know, links to, to Evan and to myself and others in our real estate and group. And it has our contact information there. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to another episode of Common Sense for Common Areas. We hope you'll join us again next week and be encouraged and better equipped for the hard work you are doing serving your association. Thanks, you. Thanks. You've been listening to Common Sense for Common Areas. If you like the show and would like to support us, you can do so in a number of ways. Subscribe to Common Sense for Common Areas wherever you find your favorite podcast. And please share it with another board member. 
do us a huge favor by going to iTunes and leaving us a five-star rating and review. You can also support us by supporting the brands that sponsor this program. You'll find links to the websites and social media for Association Insights and Marketplace, Association Reserves, Community Financials, and Kevin Davis Insurance Services in the show notes. But the most important thing you can do is to engage in the conversation. Connect with Robert Nordland, Kevin Davis, and Julie Adaman on social media. Email your questions or voice memos to podcast at reservestudy.com or call our 24-7 voicemail line at 805-203-3130. This podcast was mixed and mastered by Stokelight Video and Marketing. With Stokelight on your team, you'll reach more customers with marketing expertise that inspires action. See the show notes to connect with Stokelight. Finally, remember that the views and opinions expressed by the podcast do not constitute legal advice. Please consult your own legal counsel before making important decisions.